<laughs> okay, so my presentation is called Sexual Self-Representation and Radical Corporeality in Natasha Merritt's Digital Diaries. My life has become a bunch of digital diaries, photos, writes photographer Natasha Merritt in the opening pages of Digital Diaries, her collection of nude self-portraiture published in 2000. Merritt's statement, however simple, is weighted with a mess of inquiries, many of which I'm not able to even adequately explore in this short paper. Questions such as how do the quote unquote bunch of digital photographs that comprise her diary represent a bios or life transformed? How is explicitness and abjection employed in subversive ways in her work? How might we conceive of Merritt's now digitized corporeality? How has Merritt's life become through her biotechnical bodily fusion with the camera? What is her corporeality now? Reaching more broadly, I frame my scattered inquiries within one larger overarching question. How does digital self-representation produced by self-identified women envision differing multiple forms of critical embodiment? In this paper, I explore how the self-imaged nude body deployed through specifically abject art practices or art that involves the use of bodily fluids and orifices can stand as a generative framework that challenges conceptualizations of normative embodiment and that opens possibilities for more radical corporeal representation. As we already understand, women's artistic and cultural production in the 20th and 21st centuries is preoccupied with the politics of bodily representation. Perhaps located in closer proximity to the realm of art than is widely accepted, today's digitized self-imaging or the selfie of a deliberately sexual nature is ubiquitous on social media platforms like Instagram, Tinder, and Facebook. Digital Diaries, a veritable portfolio of selfies taken solely by Merritt using her simple Nikon camera is, I feel, an especially apt art piece to explore this idea because her work graphically is unapologetic in its appropriation of the diary form to sleuth feminine interiority in a sexual embodied way. In this sense, Merritt's work represents to a degree a culmination of the forces driving women's contemporary auto-exploitative autobiographical practices. But erotic self-imaging produced by women has long held suspect status in the realm of high art critique. Criticism focuses on the supposed narcissism of women's autobiographical projects, the perceived vacuity of the body at the center of these projects, its slippage between pornography and high art, and a corresponding tension between what it means to be either a connoisseur or voyeur of such work. This criticism is tackled wryly by fetish photographer Kroll on the inner cover of Merritt's Digital Diaries. Her favorite motif is herself, he writes. Digital Diaries is a high-tech display of sexual narcissism, contends art critic David Bowman. Fiona Atwood argues that homemade, gonzo-style erotic photography like Merritt's has become a particular object of fascination in the art world. Pornography has turned chic, she says. In art historian Lucy Suter's analysis of contemporary women's digitized erotic photography, Suter writes that she has seen, quote unquote, so many quasi-narrative art photographs of half-dressed young women that she refers to them as their own genre, quote unquote, panty photography. Because Merritt's work is structured through the diary, it is precisely her bodily explicitness, her self-obsessiveness, that becomes the mise-en-scene from and through which she aims to subvert the tradition of both masculinist self-portraiture and historically male tradition of autobiographical practice, all through the use of the selfie. By staging the body as quote-unquote obscene, Merritt uses the abject as a mode of practice through which to expose a seemingly insatiable hunger to reach deep into the crevices of feminine psychic and bodily interiority and to challenge the purported hiddenness and inherent sexuality associated with female sexuality. Tracing autobiographical confession back in history leads us to Christianity's imbuing of confession, effectively understood as purging, within spirituality and pureness. The confessional body is also the truthful body and the truthful body is clean, transparent and empty of that which has been sinfully polluting it prior to confession. I draw a connection between purging or the act of confessing and confessional matter as that which has been abjected from the body. We might read Merritt's confessions or the truths quote unquote in her diary as bodily emissions of mucus, sweat and or female ejaculate. It is important to remember, however, that Merritt's whiteness, thinness, and able-bodiedness, among other privileges she obviously holds, 
render the confessions or omissions of her body palatable, or even more than palatable, desirable. Merritt's bodily confessions are made sexy into a form of cultural capital. I point here to research completed by Sidoni Smith, who examines how the corridors in Spanish convents during the 1800s were hung with the wedding night sheets of aristocratic families, and these were sheets marked by the blood of defloration. In Merritt's work, abject matter is effectively packaged and framed, but within the fulfillment of the autobiographical pact to confess, Merritt's confessions or emissions carry cultural value as proof of her authenticity, the promise of truth telling. So interestingly, in a sense, her emissions have become commodified as cultural capital in our age of confession. What truly sets Merritt's work apart from other confessional style pieces, though, as I have suggested, is her integration of the abject within the confessional form. Um, she is adopted likely from the likes of feminist body artists working during the 1960s. By integrating the abject into her work, Merritt re-envisions the passive female nude, a figure historically painted by the European great masters. And let me just explain this point a bit further. Julia Kristeva defines the abject as that which, quote unquote, does not respect borders, positions, rules, the in-between, the ambiguous, the composite. Elizabeth Groth and Elizabeth Probin, drawing on Kristeva's understanding of the abject, theorize the body, specifically a woman's body, as the site of leaking, uncontrollable, seeping fluid, formless flow, viscosity, secreting a formlessness that engulfs all form, a disorder that threatens all order. Orifices and emissions of bodily fluids then call particular attention to the blurred distinction between inner and outer, threatening the wholeness and unitary intactness of the body and signifying the potential for matter to traverse margins of the body and transgress boundaries. In comparison to the abject, the passive female nude is both a figure and form that acts to contain and regulate female sexuality. As Linda Need asserts, the new quote unquote symbolizes the transformation of the base matter of nature into elevated forms of culture and spirit. The poses and forms of the nude are meant to seal leaking orifices and prevent marginal matter from transgressing the boundary, dividing the body and the outside, the self from the space of the other. So the nude thus evokes a rigid type of bodily smoothness and coherence. In the instance of posing the nude's form while spitting, sweating, crying, and or copulating, in other words, performing any manner of object behavior or physical sexual compulsions, Merritt's body is positioned between and exists as a simultaneous conflation of opposing forces. The chaotic interruptions of the abject, her saliva, wet hair, and open mouth as they collapse the boundaries between internal and external, and the dogged impulse of the nude form to manage and contain those transgressions. Merritt's eroticization of the abject presents an obscene nude, a nude out of control and form. The abject in Merritt's work thus undoes the pervasive bodily ordering and management of the nude's form, interrupting its smoothness. Merritt's photographs affect a sense of molecular confusion between inner and outer, and this is where the power of Merritt's work lies. Her use of the abject reminds us that the boundaries of the human body are more porous interfaces than anything else. In conclusion, I recall how Tony Adams theorizes that explaining the interrelations between photography and autobiography uncovers an inherent tendency both mediums have to conceal as much as they reveal. Tension exists in Merritt's work through her use of the camera to unveil or document female interiority. No matter how much Merritt manipulates the camera to act as a speculum in some cases, or even as a microscope, or how closely she might position the camera's eye to entry points of the body, various bodily orifices, the viewer might still be keenly aware of its failure to literally see within those cracks or holes or to give up the truth of Merritt's identity. Ultimately, I have to ask, what, if anything, is Merritt confessing in her diary? What can we see beyond the phys physiological composition of her bodily emissions between, beyond the salt, urea, electrolytes, white blood cells, water, and enzymes? For all of the purging Merritt enacts, all of the bodily emissions contorted out of her, the composition of Merritt's confessions remains unclear. And for all of the light shown on secretive or secreting crevices, all of the supposed exposure we are given access to, we are no longer closer to seeing or accessing what they are premised to conceal. Thank you. <laughs>